our God is for us, what can stand against us? Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Haggai. We will be starting in the second chapter of the book of Haggai, starting in chapter number 2 and verse number 10. Book of Haggai, chapter number 2, starting in verse 10. This is our third week in this study through the book of Haggai, the small little book of, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophet of Haggai. And uh, we are talking about God's house and how his house is being built. And uh, t today, this Sunday, we're talking about a house of blessing uh, and how God's house is a house of blessing. The place that he is building up in you and in me and the house that he is building as his church, it is a house of blessing. So if you found your place, the book of Haggai, starting in the uh, second chapter in the 10th verse, let's all stand this morning in reference to the reading of the Holy Word of God. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, and I ask the priests concerning the law, saying, If anyone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, No. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it become unclean? So the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. And now carefully consider from this day forward. From before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days, when one came to a heap of twenty ephahs, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the press, there were but twenty. I struck you with blood and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward. From the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yet yielded fruit. But from this day I will bless you. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for the house that you're building. God, that your house is a glorious house. Lord, it is a wonderful house. And God, we're thankful for the opportunity to be a part, a small part of your kingdom. Lord, of the work that you're doing in each and every one of us. And God, I pray, Lord, I pray that we would always have it on our heart to be strengthened by your word, to be strengthened by your presence, to commit ourselves to your work to your mission, and to your worship. God, you are worthy of every bit of it. And Lord, I pray today that you would speak to us. Lord, as we study and as we understand and come to understand what it means to be a part of your house, what it means to be a part of the work that you're doing, God, I pray that you would remind us how blessed it is to be under your care. Lord, that you would remind us of your blessing day in and day out. Lord, we're for how good you are to us. And Lord, we're just thankful that you're God and that you're on the throne, that you're authoritative. And God, I pray that you'd speak to us. I pray that you'd bless the reading of your word, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. She lives out in Wyoming. Time we would drive across country, and uh, it was always a lot of fun. Uh, but we would, it was before the days of GPS and cell phones and all that sorts of stuff. And I remember every year before we went on this trip, we had went to the, a gas station or somewhere, and we bought this massive atlas. And this thing was probably this thick. It had every state in the union on it, and you could flip through it. And it was updated every year. It had a, had a different uh, title on it, and, and we would flip through it, and you could see exactly where it was that you were going, and you could see it state by state. And, 
And uh, before going online, before looking up directions on MapQuest, if MapQuest even exists anymore, before Google, before GPS, anything like that, I mean, that's how we got around, I guess. We just went to the store and, and bought an atlas. And I used to love to flip through that thing for hours. That would keep me occupied on the way to Wyoming uh, so often. Didn't have any games or anything like that, especially when we were driving across country. I was always interested in knowing where it was that we had been and where it is that we're going. So all the other kids, if y'all are wondering what was different about me when I was a kid, all the other kids were playing ball and video games, I was flipping through an atlas. <laughs> Just that awkward kid flipping through a map. But, but no, we, we, would, we would look through that, and, and I was always interested in that question. You know, where is it that we have been, and where is it exactly that we are going? When I spent a summer semester in Paris and I studied at a school over there, we didn't have smartphones then, and one professor uh, had a brand new smartphone that had just came out. I don't remember if it was an iPhone or, or what exactly it was, but, but he would take this, and he was the only person in our entire group that had a smartphone in front of him, so he, he found his way around Paris pretty easily, but, but he would walk everywhere with this phone right in front of him, every, every place that he would go, and everywhere around Paris where you're supposed to be looking up and enjoying and all this sorts of stuff, he was looking at his smartphone, and I remember thinking years ago how, how sad that was, and and now, everywhere we go, we're, we're walking around looking at our smartphone, trying to figure out what exactly it is that we're doing. But if you look at Paris, what was interesting, we, we had a map that we used to learn and understand exactly where we were and, and where we needed to be going. And if you look at the metro, that's like the subway line in Paris, it looks like this massive, uh, really multicolored spaghetti, and it's just all thrown on there. There's so many different lines that crisscross around each other. And, and uh, on July 4th of that year, we had heard that the American embassy was going to shoot off fireworks. I didn't know. We just thought, hey, it sounded like a good idea. So they didn't celebrate the, uh, July 4th, obviously. We just thought that somebody had said the American embassy was shooting off fireworks. So we tried to find our place to the American embassy. It took us forever. And I thought to myself, you know, at least it's not a matter of national security that we got to find the American embassy. But we, but we went there. Nobody was speaking English at all. And here comes a couple Georgia rednecks. And... We go up to the security guards and we ask them, y'all shooting off fireworks today? <laughs> and they just looked at us like we had three heads. But critical questions that we have to answer when we're traveling. Where have you been? Where are you now? And where are you going? And that really is the heart of what we read about in this particular passage, especially with verse 15, if you'll look with me and turn with me there. In verse 15, it says, and now carefully consider from this day forward, for before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. This is literally the imagery that we are given in verse 15, as if there's a, there's a road that we're traveling on. And Haggai, through the, through the word of the Lord, Haggai, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through him leading him into saying exactly what he said as a prophet to this nation, it's as if he's given us this imagery of a signpost. That this is a stop in the road. And God is telling his people, he's saying, stop, and you need to carefully consider from this day forward. Remember where you have been. Remember everything that I've done for you in the past. And he says, since those days. And he's talking about the things that have happened in the past. But, but this is a stop in the road where we're literally at, at, at a dividing point. Either you're going to go this direction and follow me, or you're going to go the other direction and not follow me and to be disobedient to me. And so he's literally presenting this question. When we look at this in verse 10, it starts off with a reminder of where they have been. And there's a transition that takes place from verse 9 to verse 10 on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius. The word of the Lord came by Haggai. And then in verse 15, it's referring to where they are now. Consider, consider, carefully consider from this day forward. And then in verse 19, it ends with where they will be going in the future. Look at the latter part of verse 19. But from this day, literally from this day forward, moving on, I will bless you. We've been preaching through this idea that just as the book of Haggai, God was building his house, building his temple in the Old Testament, and how he allowed the, the, the people of Judah to, to become a part of that, to take part in that. And today, God is still building his spiritual house. And it's through his divine power that it is accomplished. And it's for his divine glory when it is finished. 
Won't we be thankful for that day when God finishes all this thing up? When he finishes everything up in this world and his house is built. And we are spending eternity in the presence of God. But here's the mandate for us today. We should commit ourselves to the building of God's house. And this means personally in our walk with the Lord Jesus today, it means every single day when we walk with him and talk with him and when we worship him and when we go to him in prayer, when we study his word, it means us in a personal way that we take part in the building of God's house. But then it also means for us as a church that we take part in building God's house as we serve the Lord together. And today, we're going to end on the point. That once his house is built, where God is leading us is to being a part of a house of blessing. That's the plan of God. But to get to that point, we need to ask these three questions. Spiritually, spiritually, where have you been? Where are you now? And where are you going? We have to ask that question for us spiritually as individuals as we walk with the Lord and as we seek his will Uh, For each and every day. But then we have to ask that question for us as a church. As the household of God. Where is it that we have been? Where are we now? And where are we going? So let's look at the first question together. Where have you been? It's a transition from verse 9 to verse 10. We ended on verse 9 last week. It says, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And then there's a time difference Going into the 10th verse. On the 24th day of the ninth month. Now it's December. And God is giving a new word to Haggai to speak to this people. New word is given. He presents two scenarios really as a teaching technique. God's not asking for informational purposes. When he's going to this and when he's asking them this question. He says, now ask the priest concerning the law. It's not as if God doesn't know and he needs to understand more. And God's using this as a teaching technique to get to the point that he wants them to get to. And for us to understand today. Two different scenarios that he presents. He says in verse 11, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, will it become holy? And the priest answer, no. No, it will not become holy. And then there's another scenario that he presents as well. The scenario is that if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it become unclean? And then the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. A definitive answer, it will be unclean. So the first scenario is talking about holiness. How does holiness spread? How does it, how does it, is, is, is it impacted from person to person, from thing to thing in this world? Does holiness spread in the same way that sin and unholiness spreads? We see a very different picture with each one of these scenarios. Let's start with the first one. A priest is carrying meat that's holy. If it touches something, does, it, does that thing in and of itself become holy? No, it doesn't. And here's what this teaches us. Holiness is not something that is easy to come by. It's not something that we in and of ourselves can do in this world. And in fact, we're going to talk about how the flesh pushes against that so often, pushes against the holiness of God. What is it that that made this sacrificial meat that that they were to bring before the Lord as an offering of sacrifice? What is it that that made it holy in and of itself? Well, the Levitical law, the ceremonial law tells us this, that this meat was set apart was set aside for it to become holy. So so it's literally the opposite of what happens with sin. It's not as if it, it becomes holy because it touches something. It becomes holy because they have set it aside for a specific purpose. They set it aside for a specific purpose, and they kept it away from everything else. Matter of fact, when it touches something else, it's not as if the holiness spreads from that holy meat to something else, that holy sacrifice. It's set apart. For a specific purpose, not touching anything else. We should be reminded of this today. What we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. When, when we read about us as a people group, us as becoming a part of the plan of God, us as Christians following the Lord. What is it that, that we try to do that makes us more and more Christ-like? What is it when we try to pursue holiness? What is it that, that, that we need to pursue in the presence of God? This is what God does for us and through us in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a 
chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. What is it? When God tries to use us and shape us in holiness, it's not as if we can come across holiness by by rubbing against something else or come across holiness. In that sense, we, we come across holiness because God picked us up in his sovereignty and he set us to the side. He set us apart for a specific purpose, to proclaim his marvelous light to a lost and dying world. God wants to use you in that sense, we have this illustration of holiness. Holiness doesn't spread easily. Holiness isn't something that we can do in and of ourselves. But then the second scenario is this. If something that is unclean touches any of these things, would they be unclean? You say, preacher, we don't follow the Old Testament law in this sense. We don't follow all the ceremonial principles of the law and the layout of the law. No, we, we don't. But, but, but the principles of God's word are still the same. He's still the same God. That's why we need the Old Testament. We need to go back to the Old Testament time and time again because he's still the same God of the Old Testament as the God of the New. And these principles, these truths, they last the test of time and these these ring true even even in our day to day. So scenario number two, if someone, something that is unclean touches any of these things, would they become unclean? Yes, unequivocally. The application is this, unholiness and sin spread like a contagious disease. Now, listen, if that application doesn't ring true, I don't know of another application that will. Because that principle is still true today in 2018 as it was in the day of Haggai. Unholiness, sin, falling away from the Lord, it spreads like a disease. Not touching anything else. Essentially, this this is the way that sin works in our life. This is the very nature of sin. He says that what they have to offer, uh, essentially, is unclean. You should also look at Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 1. And this is illustrating to us how this works today in in, in our day and age, 2018. And in the New Testament church, Titus, we read this, the letter from Paul to Titus in chapter 1, verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know him, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. Paul's writing about the same issue, that sin spreads like wildfire in our life. And can I tell you, Christian, can I I tell you, if we are not in a regular habit of confessing our sin. If we're not in a regular habit of coming before the Lord and acknowledging where we are, acknowledging our sinfulness and our uncleanness before the Lord, if we're not in a regular habit of that, before long, sin will become rampant in our lives. It spreads quicker than we can ever even imagine. We face these two issues today. And we, as Christians, we struggle with this, obviously, because... We're saved, but also we live in a fallen world. There's the struggle between holiness and sinfulness. I want to point out a couple of things, three things about holiness and how holiness spreads or where exactly it comes from and and three things that we learn just from this particular passage about holiness. Number one, it's not natural to our sinful flesh. Say, preacher, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I try, I try to do the things that God wants me to do. Listen, it's not natural for this body to pursue holiness. Galatians 5.17 says this, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Can I tell you, if, if we don't struggle with the flesh, we don't, we don't struggle with the lust of the flesh, we don't struggle with, with the sin nature of our flesh, and we struggle with, if it doesn't struggle against the Spirit of God, then we're not doing something right because that's the, natural, that's the natural issue that all of us face. We all struggle with the sins of the flesh. So holiness is not natural for you. When you think about your walk, your pursuit of God, 
Here's what you have to know first and foremost. Holiness is not possible with just you. Number two, holiness doesn't happen by accident. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we treat things, the things of God. We treat our discipleship. We treat the, the way that we pursue God. We treat it as if it was going to happen by accident. As if we were just going to brush up against something and all of a sudden God was going to use us and change us and mold us and shape us and who he wants us to be and all of these things. But, but, but what this tells us here in this particular passage is that holiness becoming more and more Christ-like does not happen by accident. Just because you brush up against your brother or sister because they're more holier than you are or whatever doesn't mean that you're going to become holier. It doesn't happen by accident. Number three, holiness is not possible apart from being set aside by the divine providence of God. It is not possible unless God intervenes. That's where we've been. That is who we have been. That is the flesh. That's the sinful nature of self that each and every one of us is faced with. No matter where you are now or where you will be in the future, spiritually we have all been in the same place. All of us. We have all been separated from God because of our sin. What does the Bible tell us? It's the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. And if that doesn't weigh heavy on our heart, then we don't understand the truth of God's word. Because in order for us to understand how good God is, in order for us to understand how, how blessed of a life we have in Christ, then we have to understand this, that we are in desperate need of God. Desperate need of God. Because our flesh is sinful in and of itself. It is naturally sinful because of this fallen world. And there is nothing that we can do apart from the divine providence of God to save ourselves or to get back on track where God wants us to be. And the wages of our sin, the price that has to be paid for our sin is death. If you've been saved, it's not as if you were bad in your sin. It wasn't as if God took a decent person and he made him a saved person. It's because you were dead in your sin. Dead in your sin. There is nothing that you could have done. To ever get yourself back in a relationship with the Lord. To ever see reconciliation with a holy God. There is nothing that you can do in and of yourself to save yourself. Nothing. What God did with you if you're saved. What God did with you is nothing short of a resurrection. Amen. Nothing short of a resurrection. Listen, we, we, we try to sugarcoat it so often because, because we think that, that the Bible is just useful for us today. It'll, it'll get you through whatever situation you're facing. The, the Spirit of God, we just want to use the Spirit of God in its usefulness today. Because we think it's just applicable to where we are now. Listen, we, we, we can't forget the bigger picture. The bigger picture is this. Is that without Christ, you and I are lost and headed for a devil's hell. We are dead in our sin, the trespasses of our sin. But if you're saved today, God did a glorious resurrection with you. He brought you to life in Christ. It's not as if you were a decent person and you were doing all right without God, but now that you've got God, you're doing better. No, no, no. You were dead without God. And now that you've got God, You've got life, and you have life abundantly here on earth, and you have life everlasting in heaven with God. Nothing short of a resurrection. We need to be reminded of where we have been. We need to be reminded of the depravity of our sin. We need to be reminded that there, at some point in time, if you have not accepted Christ, there is no hope other than Christ. In order for us to know exactly how good God is, we should consider, carefully consider, where we have been. The pain and the problems, the consequences that come from our sin. It leads us to our next question. Where are you at now? And can I tell you, if you haven't been saved, eternity hangs in the balance. If you haven't been saved, if you haven't acknowledged Christ as your Lord and as your Savior... 
Listen, we have no hope apart from Christ, but Christ is all the hope that we need. We need to pay attention to verse 15. As they paid attention in the days of Haggai, God says through his prophet, Now carefully consider from this day forward. Well, what should we consider? What should we think about in this passage when it tells us this? We need to consider this. Nothing happens apart from the power of God. Nothing happens apart from the power of God. All these things happen because of the hand of God. And look, look, this is exactly what, what Haggai is speaking to these people as the Lord gives him the utterance to speak. He says, since those days when one came with a heap of 20 ephahs, that's just a bunch of grain, and it's a bundle of grain, there were but 10. And when, when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 baths from the press, there were but 20. And, and, and God tells them why. God tells them why you didn't get what you needed in that moment or what you were pulling out at that moment. Because I struck you with blood and milled you in hell in the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me. Why did they not get what they were expecting to get? It's because nothing happens apart from the divine providence of God. Nothing. It's all in God's hands. So carefully consider where you are now because where you are now is because God has placed you where you are. Everything has happened because of the divine plan of God. And can I tell you this? We need to carefully consider if God is trying to get your attention, you need to listen. If God is trying to get your attention, you need to listen. He says this in, in these passages. He's telling them, I've done these things and yet you still have not turned to me, says the Lord. Consider carefully your ways. We need to be reminded of this. We need to be reminded of our desperate need of God. If we're going to consider anything, consider this. I just want to do this this morning. I want everybody to take a second and feel your pulse. I think you can feel it right here. Maybe you can feel it right here on your neck. You can feel the blood flowing through your veins. At least, I think most of us. <laughs> just take a second. That's because of the divine providence of God. Should take a second, just take a deep breath. That's because of the divine providence of God. Every breath, every pulse. Listen, we don't even think about those things. Those things happen. And, and, and scientists tell us they, they just happen. Babies, babies come into the world, that's the first thing they look at because they just, that's supposed to happen. That's supposed to take place. You don't tell your lungs to, to breathe in. You don't tell your heart to keep on beating. Those things happen because of the divine providence of God. And where you are today, you need to take a second. And, and God is saying, consider carefully your ways. Nothing happens apart from God's hand. When you go home today, you make you a sandwich you sit down and eat lunch, it's because of the divine providence of God. We need God desperately. And can I tell you, for us, in the matter of salvation, we need God desperately for salvation. If we need God just to be here, just to, to come to this place, just to breathe our next breath, then we definitely, definitely need God as a matter of salvation. True biblical Christianity is really the same message that has been passed down for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's a message of two paths. And it's not popular today. It's not, as, it's not preached as much as it ought to be today. But the truth of the matter is that Christianity is really about two different roads. One road is leading to the divine providence of God. is leading to his plan, to his purposes, to, to his presence in heaven. When we surrender and when we give our lives over to Christ. And the other road is leading directly to a place called hell. Directly to eternal separation and punishment. It's not as popular today because it doesn't sound as pretty and it makes us uncomfortable. But that's the truth of the matter. The Bible tells us this time and time and time again. Consider carefully your ways. You're either going to go into the presence of God or you're going to go into eternity eternally separated from God in a place called hell. Consider your ways. So the third question. Where... Are you going? Look with me at verse 18, verse 19. 
It says, Consider now from this day forward, for the 21st day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Consider these things. What he's telling them is this. A little bit earlier, he said, Listen, you didn't follow me. You didn't do exactly what you wanted me to do, what, what I wanted you to do in those moments. That's why I was trying to get your attention. That's why you didn't get as much grain as you needed out of there. That's why you didn't pull as much wine as you needed to out of there. I was trying to get your attention with those things. But then he gets to this point in the latter part of this passage that we read. And he's telling us this, that your works, they didn't justify the blessings of God. But notice what happens. He says, consider your future. Look ahead from this day forward. You've sinned greatly in the past. But if you commit to God, he's tell, he tells us this. He gives them this promise at the end of verse 19. But from this day, I will bless you. I will bless you. As a matter of fact, listen, this is, this is really interesting. He says in verse 19, As yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have yet yielded, not yielded fruit. He's saying this. No, nobody, would, nobody would say that for sure these things are going to yield fruit in the upcoming season. Nobody could ever make that, make that, ever, that prediction. They couldn't say, look, just as the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree, he's not going to come out here and say that they're going to yield a bunch of fruit next year. Who knows? But how God knows this? Because it's been given to him by the Lord. Directly a word from God. But from this day he declares. I will bless you. Listen. Christian. We have to be reminded of this fact. That there is nothing that we did to earn salvation. There is nothing that we did to justify blessings from God. But God is rich in mercy and love. But God is a God of grace. He's a God of grace. And he is willing to forgive. Willing to offer hope. Willing to offer reconciliation. There are blessings in the house of God for those that surrender to God. Blessings in God's house. If we simply commit, if we simply give it all over to him. As a matter of fact, God will show us. And listen, some, some people will say that the God of the Old Testament didn't show grace. Or that the God of old, in the Old Testament wasn't merciful. Listen, Christian, this is grace. This is grace. That they had done nothing to earn favor with God. But he declares unequivocally in verse 19. But from this day, I will bless you. <laughs> I will bless you. If you're saved today. One day God looked at you and he said, there is nothing that you have done to earn favor in my presence. We're created in, in his image and he's given us giftings and, and he's, he's given us so many things in this world. But the truth of the matter is there's nothing that we have, could have done to earn favor and salvation with God. But God looked at you one day and he said, despite all of those things, you surrender to me. And I'll bless you. I'll bless you on earth. I'll bless you in heaven. There are blessings in the house of God for those that are obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. What do those blessings look like? It's not as much as the blessings that we watch on TV from the prosperity gospel preachers as much. No, those blessings are more or less like this. God gives us the blessing of fulfillment. He gives us joy. The blessing of God in his house is joy. The blessing of God in his house is eternal life. Abundant life here on earth, eternal life in heaven with him. And he gives blessing after blessing after blessing. Where are you going this morning? It boils down to this. When we think about this in our personal walk, when we think about this with our corporate walk together as a church, where are we going as far as the house of God is concerned? It boils down to worship. Are we going to choose to worship God in spirit and in truth? And there are a few things that, that I think the future hold for us as a church as far as what we're called to do. Why we are being used by God today. I met with our worship leaders last Sunday night. And we had a great time. And we talked about all of these things. It boils down to worship. What, what are we pursuing in our worship? First and foremost is this, is that we confess and we surrender. We give it all over to God. 
when we come to the Lord and we come into his house and when we come to lift praises to God, what, what should our worship consist of? I think first and foremost is that we just lay it all at Jesus' feet. It's all about him. It's all about him. But secondly, corporate singing. We should sing together. The body of Christ should lift up the name of Jesus together. We should be able to worship together. Thirdly, we should, in our singing, this is biblical, we should teach and admonish one another. We should know what we're singing about and we should worship together in spirit and in truth and pursue that and pursue declaring who God is and how good God is, just as we did today. And lastly, our worship should consist of going and serving, doing what God has called us to do. That's exactly, that's exactly what the prophet Haggai is talking about. God is allowing us to be a part of this great work, the building of his house. And God's allowing us to be a part of the work today, building up the house of God. The question is, from this day forward, where are we going? Are we going to surrender or are we going to pursue him? Are we going to put it all on the table and say, God, whatever it is, Lord, I know there are blessings that await those that will surrender to you. Are we going to do that this morning? Maybe you're here today, you've never made a confession of faith. You can't go back to a moment in time in your life where you say, I've given it all over to Jesus. You've never gone... You can never go back to a time in your life, and when you think about where you've been, you can never go back and say, I, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I, I gave my heart to Jesus, that, that I acknowledged him as master and Lord and Savior. You can't go back to that time because it was never there. Maybe, maybe God's dealing with your heart today. Maybe God's dealing with your heart today. Can I tell you, we need to carefully consider how we respond to the bidding of the Holy Spirit. When he tries to get our attention, would you turn to him? Would you turn to him? just surrender. Just give it all over to him. God's house is a house of blessing. God is good to us. And we see the goodness of God so clearly and vividly when we understand how desperately we need him. Desperately we need God. Let's pray together. God, we can see your holiness, and we can see your goodness. We can see your mercy and your love so clearly because we know and we can understand and we can see our own sinfulness, our own disobedience. And God, if we were worthy, if we had done anything to earn salvation and you give us salvation, then Lord, we know that it might not be as special, but we know this, that there is nothing, nothing that we could have ever done or could ever do to earn salvation, to earn justification in your presence. Lord, your standards are so high. Your holiness is so great. Lord, your mercy, your goodness is so unfathomable that we can never reach Lord, your presence in and of our own strength. But God, your blessings come from us knowing this. <laughs> that you are rich in mercy and grace and love. And Lord, where I have fallen short time and time again. And Lord, where sin has went rampant in my life time and time again. Lord, you are full of grace. Lord, you declare, you proclaim in the midst of uncertainty in my life. You declare that if I surrender to you, that you will bless me. God, I pray, Lord, that you have blessed this house today. All of us are imperfect. Lord, all of us struggle with sin. All of us struggle in pursuing you because of the sins of the flesh, because of how, Lord, fallen we are. But God, your grace is so much greater. Where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. And Lord, let us trust in your grace this morning. 
Let us trust in your strength and your power and your mercy. And Lord, where we had done nothing to earn salvation, Lord, let us claim our salvation. Let us trust in the name of Jesus. Lord, if there's somebody here today, they cannot go back to a time and point in their life where they have acknowledged Christ as their Savior and their Lord and their Master. Lord, they they can't go back to a time where they've admitted and they've confessed to you that there's nothing they could ever do to earn their salvation, but they needed to trust in you, trust in your grace and your mercy for salvation. God, would you speak to them if it's your will? Would you speak to them? Would you urge them and encourage them? Lord, convict them to come, to give it all over to you. Lord, there's only two paths. The world tells us time and time again that that's not true. The world tells us and confuses us that there are multiple ways to get to you, but God, there's only one way through Jesus. God, I pray that we put all our trust, all our hope in you. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together this morning?